Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 10. If you have your Bibles on your phone, swipe to Acts chapter 10. By the way, if you have your Bibles on the phone, I have no problem with that. However, if I see you doing this, I know you're not on your Bible, so stop it. Um, all right, so, uh, all right, welcome, so glad to have you guys here today. Uh, if you are a new uh, guest with us today, and right in front of you is one of these connection cards. We would love for you to take that, uh, fill that out, and place it in the offering at the end of the service, or better yet, take it back to the information table, and we will trade you this connection card for a gift just to say thank you for visiting us today. Or if you are a member or a, a, a attender here at Live Oak and you have any prayer requests, you can place it on there or sign up for anything. This is a very handy-dandy little card here, uh, so please uh, leverage that and use that. So we're so uh, very glad uh, to have you here today. I have a question for you as we get going. Uh, have you ever gotten news that you really didn't want? I mean, you get the news and you're like, this is horrible news, bad news, and then it turned out to be amazing. And that's kind of, you know, kind of the thing, and only time will play that out. I mean, when we, I believe that uh, what is going to be next uh, in this church, we're going to look back and say, man, this is really cool. I remember getting the news that we can't stay in our current facility. I remember, you know, us fighting and working back and forth with the landlord and saying, you know, can we purchase? Could we, you know, uh, work out a deal? Could we... Uh, find a way to purchase the property went back and forth back and forth and we when it just got to the place you're like know what we just got to stop we got to surrender this is not God's plan for us that was bad news I didn't want to I, you know I didn't want to move I don't want to deal with the drama of moving I don't want to deal with the headache of moving but we don't want to you know we, we don't want to when we think about things, I don't think anyone's like, oh, yes, we get to go portable. And for those of you who are new, uh, we're here for about eight more weeks, and then we're going, uh, we'll be meeting at Angel Oak Elementary School on Sunday mornings. But I think that we're going to look back, and we're going to see that God had a hand in what all, what all of this was. We didn't want that news. We didn't like that news when it came. But I think we're going to look back, and we're going to see that God had his hand in this the whole time. I think we're going to see, wow, look what God was able to do because of that move. And, and sometimes we get news. Sometimes we hear something we don't like. We get news we don't like. And then later on down the road, we realize, man, that really worked out for our God. It's like the old theologian Mick Jagger said. <laughs> you can't always get what you want, but if you try sometime, you just might find you get what you need, okay? So um, with that, Lord, let's pray. Thank you, Jesus, for this day, and I thank you for the time we have to come together. And Lord, I pray that right now you would open the eyes of our hearts that we may see you, that not a single word would leave my lips, that is not first anointed by you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to jump right into Acts chapter 10 as we continue through uh, the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, where last week we saw the conversion of Saul, the conversion of a terrorist, as we talked about. And today we're going to see, actually, I believe you would call two conversions, and we'll jump into that in a little bit. Number one, uh, verse one, at Caesarea there was a man named Cornelius. A centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort. By the way, that sounds really cool, right? Anyway, uh, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people, and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision of an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius. And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon who is called Peter. He is lodging with one Simon, a tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his serpent, servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to them, he sent them to Joppa. So let's take a minute and just kind of unpack this passage. We're going to dive into a lot of scripture today, so just kind of hang on. Uh, let's just unpack this guy, Cornelius. He was a leader of a hundred soldiers under the regiment called the Italian 
cohort or the Italian regiment, okay? Uh, uh, centurions, these guys were pretty much the backbone of the Roman army. You know, you had the guys that may have been above them, but these were the guys that were kind of in the communities that were making things happen. They were the ones that enforced. They were the ones that made sure that, that, Caesar's, um, that, that Caesar's will was, uh, was executed, okay? And so, but this guy, Cornelius, he, um, being around the people of um, the Hebrew people, found himself respecting uh, the beliefs of the Hebrew people, found himself acknowledging and surrendering to the beliefs and the God of the Hebrew people. He was very generous. He was prayerful. And so this is who he is. We see the goodness of Cornelius. The goodness of Cornelius. He feared God. You know, and this was a, a big deal for a Roman to, you know, that many of them saw the Jewish people beneath him, yet he saw God living in these people, and so he feared this Jehovah God. He was generous, gave alms to those who were in need. He was a prayer warrior. He said that in the ninth hour, this is three o'clock in the day, this is the time of which these people, that, that was appointed time of prayer, and yet he was at that time praying. So we see that Cornelius is a generous man. He's a faithful man. He's a prayerful man. He would have been called by the Jewish people a proselyte of the gate, meaning that he would pray, visit the temple, etc. He could not participate in the sacrifices or the meetings because he was not circumcised. So we see the goodness of Cornelius, but in this passage, we also see the goodness of God. At 3 p.m., when Cornelius was praying, again, a prayer warrior, he saw clearly an angel. He was terrified and said, what is it, Lord? And the angel said, send for Peter. Well, before I jump into that part, which is significant, I want to notice the goodness of God that, that Cornelius was a man who was searching God and God was there. He heard the prayers. He saw the goodness of Cornelius and reached out towards Cornelius. We see the goodness of God, and, and we don't know how long Cornelius had been a searcher. We don't know how long he had been a man who was kind of just pursuing God, yet in God, in his wisdom, chose this appointed time to reach back out to Cornelius and say, listen, God has heard you, and let's just take a minute and just accept that piece of truth that God hears you. That when you pray, God hears you. That when you do good things, God sees you. That know that, that you're not out here alone. That you're not out here just randomly moving. God sees you and he is blessed and he is honored. He sees it as a memorial when we speak good things, when we pray good things, when we do good things. But it's odd, the angel had a very odd request of Cornelius. He said, send for Peter, who is Simon, who was also called Peter. And you may say, why, Pastor? Why is that a big deal? Peter is the rock. He's in charge. He's the head of the church, right? And so it seems natural that he would send for Peter. But if you look at Scripture, you dissect this. Like, why did he have to send for Peter? It, for God to, to, to have Cornelius hear the gospel... He could have sent for someone much closer. Joppa is 35 miles away. Now, that doesn't seem like a long time because we have cars, but it's a two-day journey uh, in their day. Philip, remember Philip, the guy from two weeks ago? Philip is actually in the same town that Cornelius is in. He's like just, he's a couple of neighborhoods over. It, you know, we, we see that in, in Acts chapter 8, verses 40, it says that he ended up in Caesarea. And then uh, uh, Caesarea. And then in, if you look at Acts 21, verse 8, it actually continues. Peter ends up lodging at the home of Philip the evangelist in Caesarea. And so P Philip the evangelist, he is now, the, he's like, that's his nickname. I mean, what a great name. Hey, the evangelist, what's up? You know, that kind of thing. And so Philip the evangelist is right there, just two neighborhoods over. And yet God says, hey, uh, Cornelius, I need you to send for Peter at Joppa, two days away. That seems odd. And the reason is that Cornelius isn't the only conversion that's going to be happening in this story. And so next we see a new scene 
in verse 9. The next day, as they were on their journey and approaching the city, Peter went up on a housetop about the sixth hour to pray. Six hours about noon, about lunchtime. And he became hungry and wanted something to eat. But while they were preparing it, he fell into a trance and saw the heavens open and something like a great sheet descending, being let down by its four corners upon the earth. In it were all kinds of animals and reptiles and birds of the air. And there came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, By no means, Lord, for I have never eaten anything that is common or unclean. And the voice came to him again a second time, What God has made clean, do not call common. This happened three times, and the thing was taken up at once to heaven. Now let's unpack this a little bit. Now we're moving from Cornelius, the vision of Cornelius. Now we're moving to the vision of Simon Peter. And Simon Peter, it's lunchtime, he's praying, and, you know, he's hungry. You know, what is the significance of that? It's lunchtime, and he was hungry. That's it, you know, okay, that's it. And, And so... As he was, as they were preparing the food, he kind of fell into this, this zone, this trance as he was praying, and he sees this vision, and, and uh, the, the sky opened up, and this, almost like the screen, the sheet fell, and he saw these animals, that, animals that according to Hebrew Jewish Old Testament law were unclean, meaning that they were not supposed to eat. And so, you know, and, and so the voice of the vision said, rise, get up, kill and eat that. And Peter's like, no, I, I, I'm, I'm a good Jewish man. I'm not going to do that. And I would imagine the tone of the voice changed. And the voice said, what God has made clean, do not make common. What we know about this passage is it's not necessarily about food. Well, why is there food? Well, I believe it's because Peter was hungry. And I believe that God's like, well, I'm going to use this as a nice uh, illustration. It's not only about food. I, I, I mean, it's what, you know, is this about whether or not we can now eat shrimp and pork? You know, well, I, I believe that, it, you know, I do believe that the old law is now fulfilled in Christ. And so, you know, I believe it's okay to have a shrimp kebab and a barbecue. But that's not what this is about. This is about God saying, open your heart. You need to not call unclean what I have called common. I mean, what God has made clean, do not call common. Verse 14, there is the Peter we all know and love. Verse 14, but Peter said, by no means, Lord, for I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. That's Peter. You know, I mean, if you haven't, you know, read through the Gospels and you'll see. And Peter, I, listen, I, and I get Peter. I, you know, I, I'm, I, I am If I identify with anyone, it's Peter. Strong leader, dynamic, but man, he tends to get up. His big mouth gets him into so much trouble. By the way, you cannot say, by no means, Lord. Those words don't go together, okay? You can't say, no, Lord. That doesn't work, okay? You can't do that. It's either no, because I'm in charge, or Lord, and you do whatever comes before the words Lord. But that's Peter. He's like, no, Lord, for I'm a godly man. And I should tell you something, Lord, you should know better. Yeah, sometimes we get there. But that's Peter. I believe we should call Peter Tripp. Because for some reason, he always deals with God in threes. Three times he denied Jesus. Three times he was asked, do you love me in order to restore him? Three times he had to be told what God has made clean. Don't call common. See, Peter needed, always needed a little extra, a little extra something. Some of us, some of you, I want us, some of you are great. God leads you to something, bam, you go. Some of us were like, really? Really, God? And, and we just have a, 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 an argument by nature. We just have a, a way of, of arguing and say, really, really? You need God to, to, to hit you up a couple of different times. I was reading a commentary about this passage, and they uh, brought to attention an interesting side story. Peter's 
birth name is Simon Bar-Jonah. Simon Bar-Jonah means Simon, son of Jonah. Now, not the same Jonah in the Old Testament, but still an interesting connection. That, and if you're not familiar, if you don't remember the story from when you were a little kid, you know, Jonah and the whale. Jonah was there, and God called Jonah. Jonah was a prophet. Jonah was a preacher. And jo God said, listen, I want you to go to Nineveh and preach, preach my word to these people in Nineveh. And he's like, no, those people are horrible. I don't want to go there. They don't deserve you, God. I ain't doing it. And so Jonah gets a ship, gets a, a, a boat, and goes the opposite way of Nineveh and God said what I tell you and so there's a great ship there's a great storm and they toss Jonah over and Jonah's in the water and then a great big fish whale however you want to interpret whoop, gets Jonah and now he's in the whale in the great big fish people are like that's just you know punishment of God for rejecting him no that's protection of God because that great big fish said, now I'm going to take you where God wanted you to go. And so he ends up to Nineveh. And so Jonah was scared because these Ninevites were, were mean. And he proclaims God's word. And something amazing happens. They repent. And revival breaks out. And does Jonah go, ha ha, I'm a good preacher. No. Jonah pitches a fit and says, what are you thinking, God? These are bad people. They're not worthy of you. Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, kind of have the same, same vibe with Peter. He has a hard time recognizing that God is for everybody. So on with the story, verse 17 now, while Peter was inwardly perplexed as to what the vision that he had seen might mean, behold, the men who were sent by Cornelius, having made inquiry for Simon's house, stood at the gate and called out to ask whether Simon, who was called Peter, was lodging there. And while Peter was pondering the vision, the spirit said to him, behold, three men are looking for you. Rise and go down and accompany them without hesitation, for I have sent them. And Peter went down to the men and said, I'm the one you're looking for. What is the reason for you coming? And they said, Cornelius, a centurion, an upright and God-fearing man who was well spoken of by the whole Jewish nation, was directed by a holy angel to send for you to come to this house and to hear what you have to say. So he invited them in to be his guests. Now, again, 17 Peter's still struggling. He's like, what in the world did that mean? I mean, he's like, okay, was that a hunger dream? Did they eat something weird? I mean, what was going on there? You know, uh, you know so he's kind of, he's struggling. He's, he's kind of processing, praying, okay? And that, that's a good thing. Sometimes when you don't understand God's message, it's okay. It's okay to continue. What in the world? As long as you obey. Because I believe that when you stay connected to God, the puzzle pieces begun, begin to come together. And so he's like, God, what did that mean? That was weird. And then somebody's fixing to knock at the house. You just need to go with them. The more, as long as you stay connected to God, the puzzle pieces come together. And so uh, continue on 23. The next day he rose and went away with them. Some of the brothers from Joppa accompanied him. And on the following day he entered Caesarea. Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and his close friends. This is a big deal. Cornelius was like, listen, Peter's coming. The guy in charge of the whole thing, he's coming to our house. So he invites all of his friends, his buddies. It's a party. And Peter entered, verse 25, Peter entered. Cornelius met him and fell down at his feet and worshiped. And Peter lifted him up and said, stand up. I'm just a man. And as he talked with them, he went in and found many persons gathered and Peter said, you yourselves know how unlawful it is to, for a Jew to associate with or to visit for anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I asked them why you sent for me. 
So let's unpack this for a minute. It's verse 25, you know, uh, Cornelius fell at his feet. Uh, Peter was a big deal. I mean, he's the rock. You know, he, he's the, the leader of the church, and this is, he's the head of this great big evangelistic movement. And so Cornelius, logically, you know, dealing with Rome, you know, when you, when you come across Caesar or whatever, you bow. And, and so Cornelius bowed down to, to, to Peter. How often do we, as believers even, and sometimes more, I would say, worship men more than God. It, it seems like we're so quick to worship the cult of personality. We're so quick to, if someone is big or someone is, is, is popular, to worship that rather than what God is doing through that person. And then verse 28, Peter still gets the message. He's like, you know, I'm here, but you know I'm actually... You know, I, I'm actually breaking rules being with you people. I mean, Peter's still kind of, he's still not catching what God said. He's still not catching the idea that, you know, what I have made clean, do not call common. And he's coming in, and the first thing he does is call them common. The first thing he does is like, all right, I'm here because God told me to, but you know I, I'm kind of breaking some rules being with you people. He's still, Peter's still kind of not, how, not getting it. And he said, but God told me to come, and so I came without objection. Really, Peter? Really? Without objection? It took him three times for you just to acknowledge the, 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 the vision, but whatever. We'll, we'll let Peter go with that one. So on with verse 30. Cornelius said, four days ago, about this hour, I was praying in my house. In the ninth hour, behold, a man stood with me and stood in front of me with bright clothing and said, Cornelius, your prayer has been heard. Your alms have been remembered before God. Send for Joppa and ask for Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging with the house of Simon a Tanner by the sea. So I sent for you at once, and you have been kind enough to come. Now, therefore, we are all here in the presence of God to hear what you have been commanded by the Lord. He's like, listen, I'm here. I was told by God to send for you. You're here. Thank you for coming. What you got? Notice the difference between the Gentile centurion's response to God and Peter's. Cornelius, God's like, I want you to do this. All right, hey guys, go do it. God calls Peter. He's like, nope, 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 nope. It's interesting the, the dynamic between these two. And so now we hear the gospel proclaimed. So now it's like, all right, Peter, what you got? So, verse 34. So Peter opened his mouth, which, by the way, that's sometimes scary. You know, I mean, it's like, you know, it, when, when I first read that, it's like, <laughs> what's he going to do now? But this time it's actually good. So Peter opened his mouth and said, Truly I understand that God shows no partiality. But in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all. You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning in Galilee, after with after that, the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. And we were witnesses of all that he did, both in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem, and they put him to death by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him on the third day and made him to appear. Not to all the people, but to those who had been chosen by God as witnesses, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. So in this passage, Peter Peter is still mulling over this idea of sharing the gospel, and he's focused on what God did in Judea. He's focused on what God did in Jerusalem. He's forgetting what he heard Jesus say before he ascended into heaven. In Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you will receive my power when the Holy Spirit has come for you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem. Yes, they get that. In Judea, yes, they got that. 
and Samaria. He had a hard time with that. And to the ends of the earth. And now he's still struggling with that. We have to understand, people, that this, we're used to this gospel message. We're used to this idea of Jesus. But we have to understand this is a revolutionary concept. For one God to be God of all, for one single God to be capital L, Lord over everyone, this is revolutionary because gods were generally seen as one cultural, that each culture had their own God, their own deity. And also the idea that most gods were not considered global. Most gods were cultural and, 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 and regional. And yet here you have not only this unseen God, but you have this man, Jesus Christ, who is God. Not only is he God to the Jewish people, not only is he God to Judea and Jerusalem, but this Jesus is Lord of the entire earth. This was revolutionary. It's, it's, it's easier for us to understand because the earth has shrunk so much. But let me tell you, Back then, this was a revolutionary concept. It's understandable to, to, to see that they were having a hard time grasping this, that your God, this Jesus, is not only Lord, not only God, but God of everybody, of the Jews, of the Gentiles, from J Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and all around the earth. And so verses 37 through 43 is simply Peter sharing the simple gospel. The beautiful message of Jesus Christ. And I love this, starting with verse 44. While Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit fell on all those who heard the word. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter, they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they were hearing them speak in tongues and extolling God. And Peter declared, can anyone withhold water? For baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and asked them to remain for some days. So here, Peter is finishing. He's barely done with his sermon. And bam, the Holy Spirit falls. What I love about this is sometimes it ain't about the sermon. Some of you barely listen to me right now, but God's doing something in your heart. You might get four or five words out of this whole message, but God's doing something. Sometimes it ain't about what I'm saying up here. Some, it wasn't really, Peter just had to share the gospel, and bam, the Holy Spirit took it from there. God is working. And the Jewish people were amazed, at recognizing the gospel is for the whole world. They recognized that these people, the Holy Spirit fell upon them, and they said, it's even for them. And they're like, well, well Sean... Didn't they just experience this a few chapters ago in Samaria? But yeah, if you remember, the Samaritans were at least half-breeds. They were kind of half-Jewish and half-Gentile. half, not, half Gentile. They're like, all right, it's, it's kind of weird that the Samaritans received the Holy Spirit, but these guys are straight-up Gentiles. They're the Romans. They're the bad guys. And yet the Holy Spirit fell upon them. And so Peter and the people that came with Peter, they're like, what? They were overwhelmed. And so Peter's like, all right, God, you got me. You got me. How, how, how do we withhold baptism from these people? How do we withhold God's word from these people? How do we withhold the church from these people who are now full of the Holy Spirit just like we are? So it's a lot of scripture. I have two points I want us to get out of this today. Number one might be obvious as you've heard it so far as the gospel is for everybody john 10 16 jesus is teaching he's saying listen i have other sheep that are not of this fold i must bring them also and they will listen to my voice so there will be one flock and one shepherd he's talking about the jewish people and he's like okay but there are other sheep the gentiles or i must fold them in as well Matthew 27, 50 says this, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top and the bottom. This is when Jesus was crucified. He was hanging on the cross and he shouted out. And he said, It is finished. 
And when he did, he yielded up his spirit. When Jesus' spirit was yielded up, the, the veil in the temple that separated the, 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 the ark of the covenant that housed the spirit of God, that was the holy of holies. Now the veil was torn in two. Symbolically recognizing that now that holy of holies, the spirit of God is not does not reside in one place anymore, but now is open for the entire world. Galatians 3.23 says, Now, before faith came, we were held captive under the law, in prison until the coming faith would be revealed. So that the law was our guardian until Christ came, in order that we might be justified by faith. But now that faith has come, we are no longer under a guardian. For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you who are baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Listen to this. There is neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave nor free, nor male nor female. You are all one in Christ Jesus. If you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. It is now no longer a faith simply for the Jews. It is now open season. The gospel is for everybody. It seems like a this seems like a message that would be historically embraced. It seems like a message that would be historically something that we as a church, as an ecclesia, as a church of Jesus would be able to embrace and, and, and bring light to the world through this message. And it, it should, and it is. But the church has failed so much in this area. Because we have taken on the same, the same sinful nature as the Jews that we want to hold the gospel into us. Peter, had, Peter was like, no, no, no. This Jesus, this salvation, this is for us. Us Jews, this is the culmination of, of the Messiah for us. And now as the church, we're doing the same thing. We're like, no, the gospel is for us. Us good people. Uh, uh, us, us godly people, us church folk, it's not for those people. We're still holding on to that same hypocrisy, that same prejudice. There's a famous story where Mahatma Gandhi, he was a, a, a young attorney, and he was reading the New Testament, and he came across the Beatitudes, and he was reading it, and, and he just fell in love with it. He became fascinated, obsessed with the Beatitudes in the New Testament. And he thought that the love of Jesus and the, and the Sermon on the Mount was the answer to the caste system in India. He's like, this is it! This is what's going to get India free. And as he's studying that, he becomes, uh, like I said, obsessed with studying this idea, so he decides to go to church, and he goes up to a church door, and he, you know, he's going to go in, and he's, he's met at the door, and he's stopped. And because of the color of his skin, he's not let into the church. And he famously says later, as he's talking to people, he later proclaimed that, I love your Christ. I don't love your Christians. What a powerful testimony would have been if Gandhi would have instead, uh, instead of using uh, uh, his faith to bring freedom if he was able to take the gospel of Jesus to all of, him, uh, of all of India and bringing freedom to them. That was a long time ago. And some of you are like, I don't think that really happened. Well, I did the research and it really did. I'll do something a little, a little more recent that I have first-hand knowledge of. Remount Baptist Church in the uh, 70s and 80s had a thriving bus ministry as Remount Road in North Charleston began to um, degrade as a, a, as a community and more and more poverty-stricken uh, people moved into the area. Uh, Remount Baptist Church bought a bus and they began a bus ministry where they were Sunday morning, they would just drive through the neighborhoods and pick people up and bring them to church. The deacons, not liking the type of people who were being brought in, sold the buses and stopped the ministry. I was part of the staff that years later had a service in which we prayerfully and humbly and 
brokenheartedly repented to the church for the past sins of the leadership of that church, some of which were still there. Right before I became a youth minister at Highland Park Baptist Church in Hanahan, just about 30 years ago, there was an interracial couple visited the church. They get to the door, and they were met at the door by one of the deacons, and they said, yeah, you wouldn't feel very comfortable here. You need to find another church. This wasn't decade. This wasn't a generation ago. This was in our day, in our time. This is happening today in our churches. And so when I say that the gospel is for everyone, let me tell you right now, the gospel is for everyone. Red and yellow, black and white, we're precious in his sight. And if you have, if you begin, if you think about a people, if you think about a group and they don't deserve the gospel, you've got to check your spirit because the gospel is for everyone, period, end of discussion. And as a church, we have to embrace that. As a church, we have to embrace whatever people you seem to despise as an individual, you've got to ask God to purge you of that because the gospel is for everyone. There is no us versus them because we need to all understand we were all them at one point in our life which takes us to our last point being good is not good enough see being good was not good enough for cornelius cornelius was a devout man a god-fearing man a prayerful man a man that was generous but still, his conversion was not complete until he responded to the gospel. He was not saved. He was not saved until he heard and responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ. When Peter shared the gospel, it was at that point he was filled with the Holy Spirit. And so what that tells us is that, listen, he was a good man. He was a praying man. He was a, a devout man. But he, he, that didn't make make him saved until you submit your life to jesus christ you're just a good person and there's a lot of good people in hell and so we have to get to that place that good is not good enough godly is the standard not good we have to be careful to think that we're operating on this idea that that this this you know that this checks and balances as long as i do more good things than bad things then i'll squeak into heaven it doesn't work that way Good is not the standard. Godly is the standard. Good is not good enough for Peter. His adherence to the Old Testament law was keeping him from embracing his role as a leader of the church. He was a good Jew. And God's like, I need you to be a good, a godly Christian. God's good many times can be the enemy of godly. That's what's, that's what's so hard when churches are filled with people that are resting on their goodness instead of their godliness. In our effort to be good, we can become prideful. We can become blind to the needs of others. But in our efforts to be good, we forget only God is good. And so my encouragement is to Surrender your life to Jesus. Pursue Jesus to be godly. And if you are godly, you will be good. Be godly in your words. Be godly in your deeds. Be godly in your pursuits. But all of that under the umbrella of Jesus. You surrender your life to Jesus and the Holy Spirit works in your life. You cannot be good in your own strength and think that that goodness is good enough. So I want us to respond to the word now. And so I'm just going to ask everyone just to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment. And just allow the Holy Spirit to to open your hearts. I want you to pray that the Lord will remove any prejudice from your heart. Whether it's racial, 
political, geographical. Ask the Holy Spirit to search your heart if there is anybody that you have prejudice against that you feel is not worthy of the gospel. Ask God to take that away from you. I want you to pray that the Lord will remove any desire to cling to your own goodness that might rob you of your godliness. If you're trying to do this on your own strength, by your own ability nail that to the cross and simply submit your life to Jesus and every day pursue Jesus there's going to be people in the back praying they'll be praying for you if you would like to go for some extra prayer if you need someone to pray with you and say, I just need someone to help me through this. They will be in the back to pray with you. Dear God, I thank you for this day. I thank you for everyone that is here because no one is here on accident. You have brought everyone here for a purpose. Holy Spirit, move in our hearts, move in our minds. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're coming to a time of our service. Where we're